Can you believe that we're in the year 2020? I was, uh, I was born in the 80s, and uh, I still can't really wrap my head around the fact that this is the fourth decade that, I'm, that I've been around, you know. Uh, um, some of you here are older than me, and you're like, mate, just wait a few, a few decades. Uh, others of you are like, oh, really? He's, he's already, you know, he's born in the 80s, so he's a bit older than I thought. Uh, it's just incredible, isn't it? We're in 2020. And uh, I think as I've gotten older, you'll probably hear me say this all the time in sermons. I think I do. I, I'm kind of guilty of this. But I've, I've started to realize that as I've gotten older, I reflect a lot more. Is that true for, for all of you here too? As you, as you grow older, you uh, see quite a few nods now. I can't, I can't help but just to reflect quite a bit more and on, particularly for me on how much things have changed over the last 20 years. We've seen some incredible technological advances, don't get me wrong. Now, Back to the Future didn't quite get it right. We don't have flying cars. Um, 2015 was that prediction, but uh, that didn't quite happen. Still waiting for my hoverboard. But we have seen quite a few technological advances, haven't we? Now, uh, cars, we had our first hybrid car in 1997, but we had our first all-electric car in 2008. But now our our good friend, Mr. Tesla, is bragging that he will have completely um, autopiloted cars in the next couple of years. And that's, you know, that's really only been advancements of the last 20 years. How about modern medicine? In the the year 2000, I'm not sure that um, we are, we were as advanced as now. Uh, My wife's mother, so my mother-in-law, she's going for a knee surgery this Thursday and the surgery isn't being done by a doctor. The doctors are watching as the robots do the surgery. Can you, can you believe that? You know, that, that, that technology it, it did not exist in the year 2000. Mobile phones have seen quite a bit of uh, change. Uh, many of you, like me, your first phone may have been the Nokia 3310. Uh, it was a, a good brick phone. Uh, I think it was the first one to have games on it, and the good old joke was that the 3310 was indestructible. Uh, it had battery life that would go almost the whole week. Uh, that was released in 2000. 20 years ago. But now, of course, we've got um, smartphones coming out our ears. Um, we've got, you know, like advances in technology that we, we wouldn't believe. And then, of course, uh, many of us in this room will have social media accounts. But did you know social media didn't exist in the year 2000? YouTube didn't exist in the year 2000. But now... Social media dominates uh, a lot of what we do in our everyday life. It's actually kind of incorporated in our work even. I actually know someone who doesn't watch TV or movies. To relax, he and his wife sit at home after dinner and watch YouTube. That's to me, is a very weird thing. Maybe some of you do that, but that's kind of, you know, it, that didn't exist 20 years ago, but now that's quite normal for some. So we've had lots of technological advances in the last 20 years, but we've also seen cultural shifts, haven't we, in, in the last 20 years? And I, I can't help but just ponder and reflect on some of these. Um, I'm going I'm to put your knowledge to the test here. Um, so I want to know who remembers uh, New Year's Eve 1999. Uh, I, you don't have to put your hand up, but the Sydney Harbour Bridge was lit up with one word. And this is where I want to put your knowledge to the test. Does anyone know what that one word was on the Sydney Harbour Bridge? Eternity. Quite a few of you know that word. Uh, Perhaps you don't know the story for why Eternity was written on the Harbour Bridge. It was in recognition of a guy whose name was Arthur Stace. Now, he was born and raised in Sydney. Uh, He was born in 1885. uh, And he was a bit of a a punk. He was a troublemaker. He, He was an alcoholic. And he used to just get up to no good. Uh, I can't imagine what that kind of looks like in the the late 1800s. Um, But he was known to be quite a troublemaker. You flash forward into his life, and at 45 years of age, he finds himself in a church, um, St Barnabas' Anglican Church in Broadway in Sydney. And he hears a sermon from John Ridley. 
uh, who was the minister there, about eternity from Isaiah. And, and that sermon changes his life. He becomes a Christian. And so he stops graffitiing the, in the way that he used to graffiti, and he starts graffitiing the word eternity all over Sydney. Uh, he becomes famously known as Mr. Eternity. Uh, he, anyone he bumps into uh, who sees him graffitiing eternity, uh, he tells them about Jesus, and he tells them the reason why he's putting eternity everywhere is because he's asking people, do you know where you're going after this life? And people, you know, once they find out who Mr. Eternity is, can, I mean, can you just imagine this guy's in his 60s when he starts doing this? Um, but here he is putting eternity all over Sydney. And people want to know him. Now, he dies in 1967. He was 82 years of age. And so you flash forward to 1999, the year 2000, the countdown. Fireworks go up and there's one word on the Sydney Harbour Bridge, eternity. And it's in recognition of this man. Now, you flash forward to 2020. Could you ever imagine the government doing something like that? They, they wouldn't, you know, recognize this man for, for what he had done. And, and in fact, we are now in 2020 where, uh, you know, Margaret Court, perhaps one of the most famous women's player in tennis in the world, is not honored for her accolades because of her belief in the passage that we're going to study today. In the year 2000, uh, I was in high school, and I know that there were certain things that were considered normal. For example, the nuclear family was normal. Now, nuclear family means um, a man and a woman and a kid or, or kids, right? And that was considered the normal family. But you come to 2020, and we're being told that the nuclear family is not really the norm anymore. And in some people's lives, that is abnormal with the rise of divorce and with the rise of same-sex marriage now being legal in Australia. All these things over 20 years. What a difference 20 years makes. And, and friends, for me, I think this is a great reminder for us that despite our ever-changing culture, we serve a God that does not change. And I think that's a wonderful anchor. So in this ever-changing culture, we, we need to make sure that we have our firm foundations deeply rooted and planted in Scripture. And our passage in 1 Corinthians this morning is going to give us an excellent opportunity to do that together. Now, over the next four weeks, including today, um, we're going to have a great opportunity to look at, as a church through what the Bible says on four topics, um, sexual immorality, marriage, divorce, and widowhood. And they're going to come from 1 Corinthians 6, which is what we're doing today, and then the other three weeks are from 1 Corinthians 7. And it's going to be a really unique opportunity because as a church, we're going through 1 Corinthians this year. So you might be wondering, well, why are we going to start at chapter 6? Um, there's four really good topics here, and we just thought this is a great way to start January off by looking at what our culture is talking about, really. And so that's why we're here in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. So, friends, uh, grab a Bible, open it up in front of you. We're in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. And, and as you find this morning's passage, I want to say straight away, as you heard the passage read to you this morning, you would have noticed that there's a couple of words dominating this passage, a few words dominating this passage. Sexual immorality uh, is spoken of three times. Uh, it's spoken of in verse 13 once and verse 18 twice. Um, prostitution is also brought up, uh, which, which has a very similar meaning. And this one may have gotten past you because we're very used to this word, I think. But the word body is actually spoken of eight times in our passage today. So I think the, the problem that Paul sees with the Corinthian church at this instance is to do with these themes, with sexual immorality, uh, prostitution, and the body. And if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not really that surprised that that is the problem because the nature of sin has to do with what I want. And sexual immorality and the body, they're both very focused on me. They're focused on myself. And so the problem the Corinthians are facing here is sin of sexual immorality and the body. 
But let's look past those two words just for a moment and be reminded, it's not just sexual immorality in the body. There is an overarching problem here, I think, of them looking at themselves and trying to please themselves, which is idolatry. That really is the main problem here. They are not looking at God, but they are looking at pleasing themselves. It's going to be important to talk a little bit about the, what the culture of the church in Corinth was like to see why Paul needs to say what he has to say uh, to the Corinthians. And so from verse 12, this is where we open, and this is going to be a great insight into the Corinthian culture. There's a saying that Paul has caught wind of that the Corinthians have started to say together. But the problem of this saying is that they're taking it right out of context. So look at verse 12. Um, you'll notice it's in, it's in quotation marks. This is the saying, everything is permissible for me. Now, as you look at that saying, it kind of meets what we know to be true of the good news. Everything is permissible for me. Everything, all things, you know, that's pretty similar. P- permissible, allowed. Uh, for me, when I hear everything is permissible for me, I'm taken to Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. It's kind of pretty similar, isn't it? Everything is permissible for me. I can do all things through Christ. But what was happening in this church is that there were people in the Christian community, people sitting uh, you know, in, in the pews who were going to prostitutes. And when people would say, no, 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 you know, Jesus has changed your life. You're a Christian. You shouldn't do this. They would argue, but everything is permissible for me. Because Jesus dealt with my sin, I've, I've gone into a higher level of understanding and now everything is permissible. All things. I can do all things. Everything is all good and so I can go and be with a prostitute. There's no problem with that. Well, we know there's a problem with that, don't we? We, we already know there's a problem with this and, and you need to go no further than the first book of the Bible in Genesis. God intended man and woman for each other. And just like Genesis 2.24 says, to become one flesh, man and woman are made for each other and they are made to enjoy life together and to serve God and one another. And in no way in that original setup was there another person in that relationship. You know, so for some men in the church at Corinth to say that visiting a prostitute because of a higher understanding and that everything is permissible, well, it's, it's, it's basically outrageous. It's, it's dangerous and it needs to be addressed. And so here's your attitude. Everything is permissible. What will Paul say in response? Well, he has two things to say in verse 12. Paul says, firstly, but everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Secondly, everything is permissible, but I will not be mastered. By anything. That statement, everything is permissible for me, who is at the centre of that statement? It's not God, is it? It's not Jesus. It's me. And Paul is saying, even if you have the right to do something, how you behave as a Christian still needs to be the number one priority in your life. And how you behave as a Christian is not about you. Because our actions reflect reflect Jesus and our actions affect those around us. But saying everything is permissible for me, it, it doesn't even take others into account, does it? It's just putting ourselves at the center of everything. And that's not what Jesus came for. So that's the first thing he says. He says, um, not all things are beneficial. But secondly, he says, I will not be mastered by anything. Everything is permissible for me, but is the right thing you are trying to permit actually helping you? Is it helping you to thrive and flourish in your relationship with Jesus? Or is it becoming the thing that is in control of you? Is it becoming the thing that you crave? Is it becoming the thing that you desire more than God? I think Paul is saying, who's the true master? You say everything is permissible for me, but who are you serving? Let's read verses 13 
17 together. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So let's start at verse 13. Paul says, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. Again, uh, you'll notice that this is in quotation marks. Paul brings up another saying from the Corinthian culture. So it was very common that someone would say, food for the stomach, stomach for the food. And what it appears is that the church in Corinth was doing, uh, was taking this slogan and saying, well, if it's true that food is for the stomach and stomach for food, likewise it must mean sex is for the body and body is for sex. But Paul, he's disagreeing here. He's saying, no, you can't just make that connection. It's very dangerous, isn't it, to just assume that that would be true. And he says the body is not meant for sexual immorality. It's actually for the Lord. I think it would be really helpful at this point to explain uh, one of the Greek words that is used in this passage. So the Greek word for sexual immorality is literally translated porneia. And the Greek word for prostitute is porne. They come from the same word. They're derived from the same meaning. And in fact, this is where we get, if you couldn't have guessed, this is where we get the word pornography from in our English language. The literal meaning of porneia is to engage in illicit sex and indulge in sexual immorality. That's that's what it's literally meaning. And it is a word, because it's linked with prostitution, that means it is the writing of the prostitutes. Now just think about that for a second. What the prostitutes do, that is what this word means. And I think it's important to say because we can get used to hearing sexual immorality and disconnect it from its roots. But the actual derivative in Greek is porneia. That is what this word is. And so when Paul says, our bodies are not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, he is saying, he's meaning, they are not, our bodies are not for porneia. And that definition, because, because that is what the word means, it's much broader than what we might think sexual immorality is. We can think of sexual immorality meaning uh, that person just needs to grow up because of the immorality part, or we might think it means, you know, having an affair, which our culture has made to sound fun, but it's not that. Sexual immorality is adultery. It is sin against others and sin against God. It's cheating on people. It's, it's homosexuality. It's, it's pornography online. It's all these things because it's all porneia. It is the literal reason that prostitutes exist. Prostitution is about going to other places rather than your, your husband and your wife. It's, it's about going anywhere other than what God originally intended for things. That, that they're only supposed to be found in marriage between man and a woman. And I think it's an obvious link to our two problems about s- sexual immorality and the body. These are the two big problems because they're both idolatry. They're both pointing to me being God. They're placing me above what God wants and placing my pleasure first. Now, with all that being said, I want you to keep two things in mind. One, Paul is writing to a church about this. Two, Paul is writing to his church plant. This is a church he started about these issues. And now Paul, he has to speak very clearly and very confidently to protect what some of the church members in Corinth think is okay. So what does he say? He says, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Friends, 
when you become a Christian, when we become Christians, we become redeemed. We are a redeemed person. Our whole life changes. Sin, Satan, and death, that was where we were headed, Ephesians 2 says. But now, if you are saved, Jesus' righteousness and eternal life is our future. When Jesus died for you on the cross, he crucified your old sinful nature. And this work on the cross is continual. It's daily. You died to sin. And now you live in Christ. Which means he changes us. He changes us daily. And he changes us to be more like Jesus. And that means that that every day we're being sanctified. We're being made right. We are being redeemed daily. This is your whole self. This is your new creation in Christ. Your whole person, your whole being is wrapped up in Jesus. You can see the problem with what is being suggested by this church. And so then Paul goes on to give a couple of reasons why we can't use our bodies in sexually immoral ways. And his first reason, I think, is what I would say is a physical reason. So have a look at verse 14. He says, If God raised Jesus from the dead, he will raise our bodies too. So if our bodies are going to be raised with Christ, because Christ raised from the dead, that's how we're going to be raised when we die, to be with the Lord. We can't treat our bodies as sinful like we used to, because we're saved by grace. And Jesus will return, and we will be bodily resurrected, Paul says. We're going to go to be with the Lord And so we've got to treat the life here and now, our bodies, right. Physically, we're going to be raised bodily to be with Jesus at the end. And we need to be sure that we are keeping sin distant from us. So that's the first thing. I think he says physically we need to to do it for this reason. But then Paul goes on uh, to what I would call to be a relational reason for why we can't use our bodies in sexual immoral ways. And specifically then, addresses the sleeping with prostitutes idea that had begun to take shape. So look at verse 15. Do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. It's just the next logical conclusion though, isn't it? Like if our bodies belong to the Lord, and they do, if you're a Christian here, your body belongs to Jesus. So we need to treat our bodies for righteousness. Not sin. And, and, and if I go and use my body for sin, I'm mixing what Jesus has done for me with sin. And that just doesn't work. What's even worse here, though, is they're saying it's okay to sleep with a prostitute. So not only am I mixing my body for sin, but I'm mixing it with someone I don't even know. I'm I'm relationally creating a bond with someone who's not my husband, who's not my wife, and mixing it with the pure and righteous Lord Jesus. Big problem. And Paul says, never. And Paul goes back to Genesis 2.24 as his foundation for this, because the created order is the way that God intended this to be. And it should be said that in Genesis 2, when Adam and Eve found each other, there isn't any hint of pleading for another person. It's not like Adam looked at Eve and said, oh yeah, she'll do, right? Adam is looking after the animals and he's finding no suitable helper for him. So while he's sleeping, God takes one of his ribs and creates Eve. And so when Adam wakes and sees Eve, there isn't any doubt for him. Adam sees Eve and Genesis 2.23 says, the man said, that's Adam, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You can hear the excitement in his voice as he sees Eve. We belong together. And in verse 24 of Genesis 2, the two become one flesh. And Paul says it's the same when we belong to Jesus. We're united with God under him. We're one with him. It's Jesus and you. It's not Jesus, you, and sin. There's no room for allowing sin to reign in our bodies. And this is why at the beginning of our time together, I mentioned our changing culture and how much we've changed over the last 20 years because it's not really too dissimilar to what Corinth was like. In the church, 
there's a potential movement here of cultural change that says, in Christ, everything is committed. I can do what I want with my body. I can sleep with who I want. I can believe what I want because all things are permissible now. But even though culture has shifted these views, and just as there were some Christians in Corinth who thought that, that they could do what they wanted with their bodies, we say, and we stand with Paul, and we say, actually, our bodies are not our own. They belong to Jesus. And he is not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just like in Paul's day, sexual immorality was seen as casual and harmless. Sounds familiar to our culture, doesn't it? Just like in our day, our, our culture sees sexual immorality as casual and harmless to, to the point where I've had discussions with youth that have told me that at their school in health class, they've been told it's okay to experiment with another person and it doesn't matter if they're of the opposite gender or the same gender. It's okay. I've had those conversations. That is what our culture tells is okay. But we too, like Paul, like Jesus, like the Bible, we haven't changed. We are pointed back to the bigger picture. Christ died for sin. He died for that. He, he died so that we could have new life in him. And our bodies, they don't belong to us. We are not God. That's idolatry. We belong to God. Why would we ever link ourselves with sin and defile God's name. So I think it's no wonder then that you get to verse 18 and Paul says, as strong as ever, flee sexual immorality. In Corinth, you know, everyone reading this letter is is to abandon the idea that sexual immorality, that adultery and affairs and homosexuality, sleeping with prostitutes, that that's fine. Abandon it. Paul says, flee it. Flee from it and think about your body now as what? A temple. But why a temple? I think it's actually quite obvious when you think about it. When the purpose of the Old Testament uh, temple was that it was a place where you bring glory and honour and praise to God. And it's, it's a place where God's name is lifted high. And we're to treat our bodies like that, like a temple. We are to treat our bodies as places where we bring glory and honour and praise to God, where we, we lift God's name high, where the Holy Spirit dwells because he dwells inside of us. And this can't be possible if we're treating sexual immorality as something that doesn't matter. If you think about your body as a temple, do you want there to be sexual immorality where the Holy Spirit dwells? They can't mix these two things, can they? Paul gives us a final reminder at the the end of verses 19 and 20. He says, you are not your own. He's already said that, but he says it again to use that emphasis. You are not your own. Not only that, you were bought at a price. Jesus paid for your sin on the cross. That's how much the price was. So honour God with your body. Such heavy words, aren't they, to, to finish this Statement. But remember, this is Paul's church plan. This is his church, but he needs them to understand how serious this is. They're thinking everything's permissible. I can do all things, no problem. But it does strike to the heart of the problem. We are not God. God is God. And if we trust in Jesus, our bodies don't belong to ourselves. They belong to him. The culture of Corinth is its not too dissimilar to our own culture. Live free, live for yourself, be true to yourself, do what you want to do, do what makes you happy, sleep with, with who you want to sleep with, choose your own venture in life, and it won't matter. You can do all these things, it's fine. But friends, Jesus died for our sin. We need to take it seriously. If we belong to Jesus, we are not our own. You can see how I I mentioned at the start, sexual immorality and the body were the two problems. But it really is idolatry, isn't it? Because it's when we place our eyes off of God and onto ourselves. We were bought at a price, and this price was the death of the Son of God on a cross. 
But in raising from death to life, that debt that we owe is paid. It is paid in full and we belong to Jesus. We don't belong to sin, to Satan, to death anymore. So we are to honour God with our bodies. We are to honour God with our beliefs. We are to honour God with everything that we have. Because we are redeemed. We are a redeemed person. We are someone who was taken out of darkness and into light. So we've got to get rid of that sinful nature, that idolatry, the sexual immorality, the the idea that we are more important than God and we need to honour God. Let's pray. Father, we know that this, uh, this message this morning was hard and heavy, but I thank you that despite it all, you, are, you care for our hearts. And that, that's the reason why uh, this, this passage is here, because you want us to turn from sin. So, Father, thank you for showing us of your love for us today. Thank you that you did buy us for a price and that we need to honour you in our bodies in our attitudes, in what we believe, and in our lives. Please, Father, in all things, in all conversations, in all beliefs, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus and abandon the the worship of ourselves, the false idolatry that easily creeps in. We pray this for our sake and your glory. Amen.